So thank you if you are a mumbly, mum, mum, oh. Good morning, Minneapolis. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Toussaint Morrison, your host of Good Morning Minneapolis, and this is brought to you by Onsite Public Media. If you'd like to be a member of Onsite Public Media, click the link below. It helps us create shows like this, The Basement Farmer, create mini documentaries of actions going on in the city, film community conversations, and bring public media to the public. Today, in obvious news, Mayor Jacob Fry has said that 38th and Chicago is a vital corridor that needs to be opened, which may make him one of the first white elected officials that is promising traffic to black owned businesses. Convenient timing? I don't know, you tell us. 12 angry men, try 14 angry racist white men. Yes, 14 angry racist white men decided to vote against making Juneteenth a national holiday. What is Juneteenth, you ask? Well, it was celebrated on the 19th of June in Galveston, Texas in 1865, celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation of 1862, freeing slaves that were enslaved in the United States. Let's not get it twisted. Not everybody was freed after 1865. It was basically until your state decided to act right. Slave owners went from chattel slavery to slavery and bondage to pay off their debts. Not everybody was free. Yes, Juneteenth was on the docket to become a national holiday, and the only 14 people that voted against it to be a national holiday were 14 surly white congressmen, making their great-grandfathers proud and their grandfathers proud of their choice. One of those surly white men was Congressman Thomas Massey, a Republican from Kentucky. USA Today writes, Representative Thomas Massey argued that referring to Juneteenth as a National Independence Day would confuse people. Ooh. Oh, this is off to a fantastic start, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree? And this is quite the insult to your voter base, wouldn't you say, Mr. Massey? USA Today continues. Thomas Massey was quoted. I fully support creating a day to celebrate the abolition of slavery, a dark portion of our nation's history, Massey said on the House floor. However, naming this day National Independence Day will create confusion and push Americans to pick one of those two days as the Independence Day based on their racial identity. Yeah, it will because white people picked the 4th of July as their Independence Day. So not everybody was independent that day, so now black people are going to pick our day to celebrate our independence. You see how that works out? You got your day, we got our day. But not everybody was independent until everybody was independent. Feel what I'm saying? Also, a white person's independence is gonna look entirely different than the independence of people that they enslaved, killed, colonized, and committed genocide upon. Look, you got the truth, and then you got Kevin Costner and Dances with Wolves. You got the truth, and then you got schools teaching kids about delightful pilgrims and Thanksgiving. You got the truth, and then you have the notion that all slaves were freed right after they signed the Emancipation Proclamation. No. And I don't think anybody's gonna complain about having two different celebratory cookouts over the course of two weeks. More is better, the truth is good, why the f are you so salty? We're gonna celebrate Black Independence Day regardless, whether you think people are gonna be confused about it or not. And also, saying that people are gonna be confused, seriously, are you trying to insult your voter base? Look, there's a black version and a white version to nearly everything in America. And we usually figure out what the real thing is when we listen to it or we look at it. I mean, take for example, I shot the sheriff. Bob Marley versus Eric Clapton. I think we know what the original is. Or Tutti Frutti, for example. You listen to Pat Boone's version and you're like, okay. And then you listen to Little Richard and you're like, yes, this is what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Lastly, I'll get funky with you. Ball and chain. Big Mama Thornton versus Janis Joplin. Yeah, you guessed it. A black woman wrote Ball and Chain. Big Mama Thornton, not Janis Joplin. Look, like I said, there's nearly a black version and white version to everything in America. And usually the one that's more dope is, you know what, Mr. Massey? I'm gonna let you talk to your grandkids and figure that one out. In local news, charges are to be dropped against Bogdan Verchurko, the truck driver who was driving down 35W and almost struck a plethora of protesters on the highway just days after Minneapolis police murdered George Floyd. This paired with recent events of another white man named Nicholas Krause who sped down Lake Street, plowed into protesters on Lake and Girard, injured several, and killed one. This is alarming because it could set the tone for what accountability may look like for Nicholas Krause or not, especially when Mike Freeman, the Attorney General of Hennepin County, has referred to Nicholas Krause's actions as Dukes of Hazard-like. Bogdan's attorney was quoted in NBC News. Defense attorney Kevin DeVore said the arrangement is 
what's right for his client and the community. Quote, they had to prove my guy had the right sight lines to see the crowd in time, and it would come down to testimony in a trial about reaction times. So I think it was a combination of looking at the evidence and also what's right for him and what's right for the community. Yes, because as a professional driver, you didn't think it was strange that everybody was pulled over and you were alone on the highway. I also want to point out that Bogdan's attorney referred to Bogdan as my guy. What are you doing? You're his attorney, not his dorm roommate. And let's talk about that sight lines argument. Let's take a look at a video from MnDOT the day that Bogdan took his drive and almost mowed down a plethora of protesters. Here it is. Okay, here we look at the video. There's everybody pulling to the side of the road because they know better. And here's Bogdan barreling down the center of the road about to endanger countless lives of protesters on the highway. That is reckless, but apparently not chargeable. Minneapolis is in a state where it drops the charges against a truck driver who endangered the lives of hundreds that were protesting state-sanctioned violence. Minneapolis also didn't bring any charges to a white store owner, John Ripple, who shot and killed a black man, Calvin L. Horton Jr., while in a protest against state-sanctioned violence. And today, we're awaiting if Nicholas Krause is gonna be held accountable for committing vehicular homicide and killing Deanna Knightick on June 13th while she was protesting, you guessed it, state-sanctioned violence. The question to you right now is, how do you feel about the safety of protesters and being able to engage in your First Amendment rights here in the city of Minneapolis? Let us know in the comments below. Following up in local news, PBS decided to repost an article from the Star Tribune, and it reads, Number of gunshot victims in Minneapolis is up 90% from last year. Solutions elusive. Damn, I wonder, was something keeping people inside last year? I can't, I wonder what it was. Nothing sells like fear and panic. But you already know that now, don't you, Star Tribune? Mm -hmm. The article goes on to talk about gun violence and deaths by gun violence, and then continues into a subheadline that reads, Down by 200 officers, department officials say it is no coincidence that the rise in crime comes after the departure of at least 200 members of the city's police force. Ah, yes. It was only 200 officers between us and utter chaos. Did somebody say copaganda? Anybody? No? Okay. Well, it also could be due to the fact that we're suffering the after effects of one of the worst economic crises in a hundred years, a global pandemic, and having to be subject to nine and a half minutes of state sanctioned violence and torture that resulted ultimately in the modern day lynching of a black man. I don't know. But what do you think? What do you believe is the cause of a 90% rise in gun violence after a year of quarantine? Seriously, tell us in the comments below. We want to know what you have to say before we start leaning in on PBS, Star Tribune, and other major news networks on what they have to say. Seriously, what do you think? Also, I want to take a closer look at this headline. DJ, could you zoom in on that? Zoom in a little bit closer. Handguns for sale sit behind glass in cases, thank God, at the Stock and Barrel Gun Club in Chanhassen, Minnesota. I'm sorry, PBS, what you saying? Did you just say that the gun problem is out of control? Here's where you can buy more? Or were you saying, come to Chanhassen, this is where it's safe to buy guns? I don't feel comfortable with either one of those. Did PBS and Star Tribune just low-key put out an ad for the Stock and Barrel Gun Club in Chanhassen? Are y'all getting like a percentage of the sales in the next week? This is insanely confusing, unlike Juneteenth. In other news, community members have come together to create the Wince Marie Garden on Lake and Girard. The Wince Marie Garden has been put together by community members to remember Winston Smith and Deanna Marie Kanidic. Community members are asking for soil, wood to make raised beds, a water barrel to collect water, and a shed to hold supplies. If you can bring any of that down to the Wince Marie Garden on Lake and Girard, please do and support the community members and the people putting that together. Also supporting our black owned businesses today, you can get down to Trio. Yes, and I just learned this today too. I didn't know Trio was black owned, but now I learned about it and hopefully you're learning about it. Trio is a plant-based restaurant on 610 West Lake Street. Trio Plant Based is owned by Lewis Hunter, the first black owned vegan restaurant in Minnesota. He started this family owned business after he was wrongly arrested in 2016 for participating in a Black Lives Matter protest in the Twin Cities. Lewis lost his landscaping job and his home due to the charges against him and it took two and a half years of fighting before the charges were dismissed. Shortly after the charges against Lewis were dropped, he shared his desire to open up a food truck and his determination led him to investing in a full service restaurant. 
So get on down to 610 West Lake Street and check out Trio. Support Black-owned businesses. That will be it for us here at Onsite Public Media's Good Morning Minneapolis. Thank you so much for watching, sharing, or, or just anything that you've done to support Onsite Public Media. If you want to become a member, click the link below. That'll do it for us today. Our work is never, ever, 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 ever done.